I, I don't know about you, but the funny thing about memories, uh, the, or as you get older, uh, I'm discovering these things. You no longer have that clear stream of memories that you, de that you did when you were young. It's not that clear stream anymore. Instead, what you have are what I call flashes of memory, right? Um, in fact, I'll share a couple of those with you. I, I remember uh, when I was seven years old, my grandmother said to me, Scott, come over here. And I said, what do you mean? She says, well, you know, you're over there. Come over here. So I did. And, and she says, Scott, uh, I, don't tell your mother that I'm, I'm, I'm giving you this $10. She handed me $10. Don't tell your mother I'm giving you this. And I said to her, it's going to cost you a lot more than that. I was already a, a very much a business-minded person back then. But I wasn't very good with my money. Um, I remember one time I went to a drive-in theater in a taxi cab. That movie cost me $239. So sometimes things like that didn't work out for me. Um, what's the most distant memory that you have? You don't have to say it out loud. That was actually a question that was asked of me when I was in graduate school. The professor asked that question. Think as far back as you can. What's the most distant memory that you have? And he told us that he re remembers events from when he was two years old. And I said to him, I think I can do better, better than that. He said, oh, really? How? And I said, well, I remember when I was a fetus. I used to sneak out at night while my mom was sleeping. In fact, I, used, I, I thought now's the best time to start stealing stuff since I don't have any fingerprints. <laughs> but anyway, sorry. Uh, I, you know, I, I think it's always interesting when you think about what sparks a memory. You ever have these things happen? Something sparks a memory. Sometimes it's a piece of music that you hear or a song on the radio that sparks a memory. There's an association that you have with that. Uh, and even sometimes it's, a, it's an aroma. It's a scent that you pick up. And it reminds you of something from the past. You ever had that happen? Uh, let me give you an example in our household how this happens. And it continues to happen. When my kids were really little, um, on occasion, when you know, we live far away from my parents, my, my kids call my parents Nana and Papa. Well, every once in a while, we get to go visit with them. We drive down to Florida from when we were living up in West Virginia. We drive down to Florida. It was a big deal because it didn't happen very often. But one of the things the kids would always talk about was Nana and Papa's house had a particular smell, had a particular odor about it. And they would recognize that, right? And then when we would get packages in the mail from them, when they would open up those packages, they would immediately say, there's that Nana and Papa smell. It was in the package itself. And those, those, that was always a pleasant memory. For It would, it would prompt pleasant memories because that was a, a very pleasant uh, aroma or fragrance that they would connect to those experiences that they had with Nana and Papa. And, you know, it's interesting, those connections that we make. You know, the Bible talks about that as well. The Bible has something to say about smells and aromas and their connection to memories and their connections to prompting us about our mission. And one of those passages comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 2. I'd like us to look at that for a few minutes this morning. Uh, Paul is writing his uh, second, possibly third letter to the church at Corinth. We only have two of those in the Bible. Some scholars think there were at least three of these letters that he wrote. Um, but the church at Corinth, this is a church that existed in a far away from the Middle East. It was a, a Greco-Roman city, a Roman province, a highly, highly commercial city at the time. And they had strong Roman influences, but it was also a very diverse city. There's a lot of commerce and trade that took place there. Paul, in the middle of writing to them, he has this to say. And this is chapter 2, verse 14. He says this. But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us 
in triumphal procession. And notice this, and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, a fragrance from death to death. To the other, a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things, he says. Now notice that he speaks of a number of things here that we may not be all that familiar with. He starts off by talking about how we are always led in triumphal procession. Triumphal procession. Now, I think Paul is writing about the, you know, when he uses the word us, he's talking about himself and the apostles and those early believers. Um, that's who he's conveying this to. And so what does he have in mind? Well, the triumphal procession was actually something that happened in the Roman world. It was a real thing. He's tapping into this because anybody who lived in Corinth knew something about how the Roman processions worked. These were the occasions on which a Roman general who had achieved a great victory over an enemy, a foreign power, would arrive back in Rome and he would come into the city with a parade-like procession and he would be out front on his horse. And there would be all kinds of banners that would be there proclaiming his victory and the greatness of Rome and their army and their god Jupiter who would help them achieve this victory. And the streets would be lined with people and there would be banners placed everywhere. All the temple doors would be open and decorations would be around the doors incense would be burning inside of those temples and it would be pouring out into the streets and the fragrance would be extremely potent and strong. And as the Roman general would parade through the street, lined up behind him were his captives, those who he had defeated and he had brought them back into Rome to showcase those who he had achieved victory over. And in the front of those captives were the military leaders of those who he had defeated. And they would head down the street towards the big temple to Jupiter. And when they arrived there, those defeated generals would be taken out and they would be executed in public to show the greatness of Jupiter in defeating the enemies. They would be heading down a pathway to death. You see, but for those who had won the victory, it was the fragrances and smells that they would inhale would would prompt in them the experience of victory. But for the captives, the smells and odors that they smelled would be the aroma of death. You see, and this is what Paul is tapping into because those in Corinth knew about this. There were arches that had been erected in that city, as in all Roman cities. And those arches were the arches through which the victorious generals would come. And on those arches were carved pictures of defeated enemies. And you could look at those and you could see the faces, the countenance of those defeated enemies portrayed there. Whether it be the Gauls whether it would be uh, Greeks, and sometimes you would see pictures of the Jews, like after AD 70, they, they brought back the, uh, the loot from the victory when, and the stuff they took out of the temple. And there were pictures on, you know, of that that were carved into these arches as well. So this is what Paul has in mind, and he knows that the Corinthians knew about this. And it would prompt in, in them the smells that they were, would associate with that parade, with that procession. But Paul is mixing metaphors here in this passage because not only does he have this in mind, because he mentions in verse 15, for we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing, he said. Why does he mix this metaphor? This metaphor is coming from the book of Leviticus. 
you see. And Paul does this all the time. He likes to mix metaphors. He takes one from the Roman experience and he takes one from the Jewish experience. What metaphor is this? It's the one that was a part of the sacrificial system. When the uh, Jews would offer sacrifice when the, in the Levitical system, when the priests would offer sacrifices, it would describe the smoke that would arise and there would be incense that would mix, be mixed with that as well. It would arise up into the heavens, up into the sky, and they would describe it as being pleasant in the nostrils of God because God would be receiving this and would be pleased by this. Even though the sacrifice would be a death sacrifice, a burnt offering, something had to die. It would be the experience of death for one thing. It was the experience of life for others. Through the death of the lambs and the goats and the bulls, okay, life would be experienced as a result of that, you see. And the purpose of the animal sacrifices was to convey to them that something had to die in order for you to live. You see, even your physical life is dependent upon the death of something, you see. But in our spiritual life, because sin separates from us from God, the wages of sin is death. So there has to be a spiritual experience to this as well. And this was what the purpose of Christ's coming was. He died and his sacrifice was accepted by the Father on our behalf. And so he taps into these images, uh, these memories, these experiences the smells and the aromas, aromas that, that prompted the memories and the experiences that people had. And he infuses them with these ideas, these theological ideas. And it's a fascinating thing to think about. When Paul, he has in his mind something that I think is fascinating here. Because we might be inclined to think that he's using the Roman procession of of, of, of victory that he has in mind here that this is our victory and we're the ones that are experiencing this and smelling and having the, the, the aroma of victory you know, going into our nostrils. But he has something else in mind because he sees himself as being in this procession with the other apostles who are experiencing death. You see. And this is the thing that that is puzzling in, in, on the surface because on the surface, it's like we should be the ones who are experiencing the victory. But Paul has in mind here that the victory is experienced through death. You see, it's the exact opposite of the way the Romans would have seen it because Paul says, I am a part of the entourage in the sense that I am one of these captives. Later on in chapter 4, he puts it this way. He says, we always carry in our body the death of Jesus so that his life might be manifest in our bodies. Does this not remind you of elsewhere of what he says? For me to live as Christ, but to die is gain. And how you put to death the deeds done in the body so that we might live according to his likeness, you see? Because it is through death that victory is achieved. He has been killed for the sake of Christ. You see. But that killing, that dying, is the very thing that brings life. You see. And so he sees himself as being one of the captives that Christ has won. Now think about Paul's past. And this, you can see how this makes sense. Who was this guy? He was Saul of Tarsus. And what was he before Christ? He was a Pharisee. He was a very zealous religious ruler. And what did he do? He persecuted the church. You see. He went after Christians, rounded them up, arrested them, oversaw their imprisonment and their executions. This is what he was involved in. And one day, on the road to Damascus, he had an encounter with the risen Jesus, which radically changed him. So much so that he looked at his past and he says, all that stuff that I used to think was so great that I could brag about, 
He says, I count it all as rubbish. He had the highest education that anybody could have had back in that day. He had a place of privilege. He, was, he called himself, I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. I was the most zealous person out there for the law. I kept it religiously. So much so that I saw these Christians as the scum of the earth. They were destroying Judaism, he thought. But now when he realized that he had to die to all of that, and he did, he died to that life so that he could live for Christ he saw that as a life that was perishing. And he saw himself now, not as a great person, but rather as a slave, as a servant to Christ. As if he had been, had been defeated by Christ and he was now in that procession you know, that, that was being led as a captive uh, because of what Christ had done for him on his behalf. Now that imagery that we see there with regard to the aromas, does not begin here. We find it elsewhere in Scripture. Do you remember the story of Jesus? Uh, he was anointed by this woman named Mary with a, a very expensive perfume. It says in John 12, verse 3, Mary took a pound of very costly perfume and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of that perfume. Remember that story? Um, Jesus said in response, remember, Judas gets upset about this. Remember that? He says, that's a waste. That's expensive stuff. It's a complete waste. We could have sold that and given money to the poor, says Judas. But remember what Jesus says in response. He says, she is preparing me for my burial. That's what he says. She is preparing me for my burial. Now, I don't know that she thought that when she did that. In fact, I think her act, that act itself, was an act of her faith and her belief that Jesus was the Messiah. Because this was this, that fragrant smell of, of perfumes and of myrrh and frankincense that they would mix with the oils. That was a kingly odor. That was a kingly fragrance. It was associated with royalty. And so when she did this, she was declaring publicly her belief that he was God's anointed one. That he was God's anointed one. We sometimes forget that in that world, in the ancient world, instead of placing a crown on the head of a king at his coronation, they rather would anoint that king with oil at the coronation. And that oil would be mixed with different powders that would produce fragrances. And among those fragrances were frankincense and myrrh. You recognize those two fragrances? They are part of the gifts that the Magi brought to the baby Jesus. You see, those were gifts for a king. They were extremely expensive to produce. And they had to come from a long way off. That's what was part of the cost, was borne out in that way. And usually, the ceremony of anointment was reserved for specific things, whether it be sacred objects in the temple or for anointing priests and kings. And these were meant to show that this was set apart by God. These were God's anointed things. In fact, the very word Messiah comes from the Hebrew word Mashiach, which literally means God's anointed one. It's the same word in Greek that we have for Christ. Christos is just simply the Greek word for Mashiach in Hebrew, for Messiah, who Jesus is called. And that fragrant flowing oil was kind of like an invisible crown that, that conferred an aura of holiness for that person when that, when that fragrant oil was placed on them. And everything that had that unique scent would be known to everyone as God's special possession. God's special possession. In fact, after the initial anointing at the coronation for a king, kings would hire perfumers. And these perfumers were specialists in mixing different herbs and spices together to produce a unique fragrance 
that would be represented by that particular king. That king had his own smell, if you will, his own odor. And whenever a king would come out in public, whether to sit on his throne and hear cases and make judgments or to proceed in a caravan down through the streets of the city, those perfumers would be called in and they would mix their concoctions together and they would anoint the king's clothing, his robes, with these special scents. And so that whenever you were in the presence of that king, that odor, that fragrance would be present. And there would be no mistake that the king is here. We can smell him, you see. And we have this language that's used in the Old Testament by both David and Solomon. David writes in Psalm 45, verses 7 through 8, this. This is from King David. You have loved righteousness and have hated wickedness. Now listen to this. Therefore God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of joy above your fellows. All your garments are fragrant with myrrh and aloes and cassia, he says. So he's tapping into that imagery and that memory that everyone would have. I remember that, that smell. It's a kingly smell. I remember the royalty that I was present with when that happened. And in Song of Solomon 3, 6 through 7, we have this. Uh, what is this coming up from the wilderness like columns of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and frankincense, with all scented powders of the merchant? Behold, it is the traveling couch of Solomon, 60 men, uh, 60 mighty men around it of the mighty men of Israel. Again, provoking within the minds of the readers these images that they were familiar with, images and memories of scents and fragrances that depicted greatness in mighty people, mighty kings. And so in ancient times, this would have been obvious to, to, those, uh, and to those who would be around the king, not only because of the jewels and the robes that they would see that, were, that the king would adore, but also by the scent of those expensive oils that they would smell. This would be a part of it. This would, these royal figures would parade through the street, streets, as I said, and those smells would accompany them. In fact, we have an account of this very thing in 1 Kings chapter 1. When Solomon uh, becomes king, he's anointed as the next king of Israel, and he's placed on the donkey, and he's paraded through the streets of Jerusalem as the people stand by and cheer. This is how it reads, 1 Kings 1, 38. So Zodak the priest went down and had Solomon ride on King David's mule and brought him to Gihon. Zadok the priest then took the horn of oil from the tent and anointed Solomon. Then they blew the trumpet and all the people said, long live King Solomon. All the people went up after him and the people were playing on flutes and rejoicing with great joy so that the earth shook at their noise. So as much as the anointing portrayed a person as being set apart by God for a purpose, the ultimate anointed one that everyone hoped for was the Messiah, the Christ, the King of Kings who God would someday send to reign over him. So we go back to the story of Mary. This is what I think Mary has in mind. Her action, even though it was not an official anointing, but rather it was an expression of her own extravagant worship of King Jesus. That's what she was doing. That's what she was communicating. That's what she was saying. You see, she knew that he was the one who God had chosen to redeem the world and reign over it as Messiah and Lord. You know, the Gospel of John tells us that she did this the day before Jesus rode a donkey into the streets of Jerusalem on what we call Palm Sunday. That's how the Gospel of John has this same story set up. So think about it this way. It says in the Gospel of John that not only did he, she anoint his feet, but she anointed his clothing and his head. 
Now, these were very strong fragrances. The very next day, that fragrance would have still been very strong and potent on him. And what did he do the next day? He came riding into Jerusalem on a mule, on a donkey, just like Solomon. And what were the people in the, doing in the streets of Jerusalem? They were crying out, Hosanna. And they were crying out that he was their king. The Messiah had come. Remember the Pharisees didn't like this. They went to, the, to Jesus and said, you need to tell these little children to shut up. It's not exactly how they said it, but they were saying that nonetheless. Tell them to be quiet. And Jesus said, if I do that, the rocks will cry out. The rocks will cry out. I guarantee you that as Jesus rode through those city streets, the scent of those expensive perfumes that Mary had placed on him would have been present. People would have smelled that and they would have said, here is the smell, the aroma of a king. And it would have reminded them of that passage that I just read to you about Solomon's coronation. This is the connection that they would have made. And then a few days later, when the tables had turned and Judas comes into the garden to arrest Jesus with those Roman soldiers, with they, they weren't Roman soldiers, they were temple guards. When he came in there, do you not think that that smell would have still been on him? Yes, it would have. The smell of a king, the aroma of a king would have still been present. But they nonetheless hauled him away and they took him to trial and this king died on the cross. His garments were divided up among those who stood by him. He died as a king for us. And this is why Paul says what he says. Always we are carrying in our body the death of Jesus. So that his life may be manifest in our bodies. Going back to 2 Corinthians 2. I have a question for you. As you are going about your daily life. Do people smell the fragrance of the knowledge of Christ in you? Do they smell an aroma that is life-giving? That shows that you have died to yourself so that you might live the Christ. All these are metaphors, obviously. But they are chock full of theological meaning that is relevant and practical for us today. How... Do people perceive you? Do you carry a pleasantness, a pleasant aroma in terms of your speech, in terms of your behavior, how you respond in adversity, how you respond when someone criticizes you? How do you react to that? How do you respond in times of trouble and trial? Do they see Christ in you? Do they see that pleasant aroma admitting from you because you have the knowledge of Christ.